Hi everyone, it's Katie Crysdale here with Lakeview Aquatic Consultants. I'm continuing on with this interview series where I'm talking to different aquatic professionals about topics that are genuinely interesting to me. I had a correspondence a couple weeks ago with a colleague I hadn't spoken to in a while and there was something really interesting in her email. So I invited her to chat with me today about this cool software she has linked in her email and have a bigger conversation. So welcome. Awesome, thanks for having me. Can you introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your background in recreation or aquatics. For sure. So uh, my name is Gina Wakai. Um, I'm a swim instructor here in Amiskwichi Waskahegan uh, or Edmonton, Alberta. And I have been working in aquatics for nearly 20 years now. Uh, I started in 2006 in my hometown pool in Vermilion, Alberta. And then I started working in Edmonton in around 2011. So it's, it's been a while. I always have to constantly remind myself like, oh, it's been, oh, it's been that long. Well, then we're get. I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel like I'm getting to the point where I should stop mentioning how many years I was doing it because I feel like the young ones are like, she's a dinosaur. It's not cool. You know, initially we would build up our experience and now I'm thinking it's time to taper how much of that I admit to. Yeah, it's still good for me. Like when I teach, uh, Swim instructor courses, they're all like, oh, you've been teaching before, since before I was born. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, definitely a flex depending on the audience. Sometimes I feel like I lose them, but I think to your point, it's also great to be able to establish that you know what you're doing right from right from that first hour, what that class is going to look like. <laughs> so we hadn't spoken in a little while and you were looking for a resource that I happened to have downloaded. So I sent that to you via email and in the back and forth, I happened to notice in the signature of your email with your day-to-day -day job that you had uh, something I'd never heard of called name drop. So can you talk to me like what is this how did you come across it and why did you feel it was important to add that into your signature so as you can probably tell my name is a non-western name so it is when you look at it on paper most people's question is how do i say that and growing up in small town alberta i was the only or one of the only uh, kids of color in the town so it's an interesting experience to look back on it now and remember whenever we had a substitute teacher in school i always knew when they were getting to my name because they would hesitate or they'd pause right before it and i just immediately being like i'm here so the reason i found out about name drop is because somebody else at uh, my full-time job uh, aquatics is my part-time career my hobby job as i like to call it had it in his email signature so i i saw it and heard the way that he said his name and just kind of grasped onto it i was like great now i can have something that tells people in advance how to say my name so that if I meet them, like sometimes you just have correspondence with people over email and you never actually meet in real life. But if I meet them, they have an idea of what it is my name sounds like. And you don't have to have that awkward bit of the conversation of have them pronounce it incorrectly or have another person not even try to pronounce it because they're afraid of getting it wrong. So it's just like they'll try, but they're going to be more accurate than if they just tried with no information. I'll put an example. This is a quick demo video on Drop is and how to use it. Drop is a name pronunciation service. So we help people get your name right. And it takes literally two minutes to be up and running. You record your name, you can share it alongside uh, your contact information. The way name drop is used most at the moment is in email signatures. The, my name and the word pronounced. So you can click here or even on the logo. So I'll click here and it'll open up my name drop profile. So when you send an email to anybody, they'll get a signature and they can check out your name. Another way to use name drop is on your personal website. So here you can see my name and the name drop logo right next to it. For over, you can hit the play button to actually play the name right on the magnifying glass to go to the link. LinkedIn, right now we're not plugged in with LinkedIn, so eventually we'd like to be right here so you can play the name right away. In the meantime, there's two places to use it. It's here under contact info. You can place it as their websites. And when you click, it goes to your link again. And another way is right here in your summary. Uh, when anybody's reviewing your summary, they can see your name drop link as well. Go here. 
There you go. It allows you to record your pronunciation, which I thought was so critical because I recall when I went to graduate my bachelor's degree at university, they had us fill out a piece of paper for the announcer to kind of spell out how we would say our last name. And my name is Crysdale. It's not particularly hard, but definitely 50% of the time people are not sure. Maybe they have an American background. Is it Crisdale, like Chrysler? Needless to say, my own pronunciation based on my family origin and my preferences may not be the way that it's it's linguistically pronounced. And so I particularly love that you, like almost like an introduction to you, if somebody doesn't know you, they get to hear your voice and how you pronounce the name. Have you had any feedback from people about using this? How long have you had it in your email? With this, this email, probably the better part of two or three years. And with my full-time job email, I would say three years. I didn't add it in to my city email immediately after, just because with the, with many of the people like they, we've already met. So it wasn't crucial at that time. But then I, I considered like, I'm still emailing people that don't know me and I should probably put it in there. I will note though, that the name drop only functions in the desktop version of email. So if I'm sending an email from an actual computer, and this uses Gmail as their email platform, so it will show up there. Most of the time I am not at a computer when I'm sending work emails, so I'm on my phone. So it does not appear in my mobile signature. Well, hopefully that's something they can rectify down the road. I think the thing that was really interesting for me, there's been a big conversation in aquatics in a lot of progressive workplaces in general about pronoun usage, but this was the first time I'd seen anything to recognize people's name autonomy. And I thought that was a big step. Is it something you've encountered in Edmonton? Because it's definitely not something I've encountered anywhere in Calgary or Southern Alberta before. No, it's still something I haven't come across outside of my full-time job or anything like that. I do see occasionally American folks who use it, but it's still very rare. And it's interesting you bring up the point of how we think our name is said versus how other people might interpret it like even the way that I say my name because of my accent where I grew up is still different than the way my parents would say my name not that it's too far off but the intonation and where the emphasis on syllables or sound stress it is different it's distinct so it's an interesting point like even the way that your family says your name and the way that you say your name can be entirely different it's it's important that people are able to make that distinction. I know when I first moved to Northern Alberta, I was living in a community called Lac La Biche, and initially I pronounced it with the French pronunciation because I grew up in Ottawa, and it was very important that French articulation was done as best as one can with accent. And I learned very quickly from French populations and people native to the area that that was not how they generally said the name. Certainly, you could say it with a French accent, but that was not their preference generally. And so respect their own preference as people who grew up there for multiple generations was important to me. And you could also tell who was an outsider and who was a local just in the name name pronunciation. With your name, I know the first time we met, you were very good about pronouncing your first name. But even then, I was thinking when I, I used the name jock because I had no idea how to pronounce your last name. How have you found people prior to something like this? What is the most respectful way somebody who is not confident about saying a name? How have you found is the most respectful way to approach approach it? I think that for me, it's just a simple question. I, I see your name here, but I don't know how to say it. Could you say it for me? Just that simple, basic question. Usually in aquatics as well, I, I don't generally say my last name. I was actually reflecting on this a couple weeks ago. I'm sure there are people that I've worked with for years that have never actually heard me say my name in full because I usually just introduce myself with my first name. If you're teaching a lot of courses, you only ever really go by your first name. So it was definitely try to make sure that if you're going to say my name, you have the full context as opposed to just the piece of it that you might use on an everyday basis or the thing that is going to stick out in your mind to answer your question. To me, a simple, could you say it for me? And then I also have a... Um, like a phonetic way of remembering. So the, the first N is silent and the rest sounds like Guinness. And that is also a way for people most easily remember like, oh, it's going to sound like this. And I, I guess the question I had for you, and I don't expect you to be an expert on all things name related, but 
what is what would you do going into somewhere like Starbucks or any of these restaurants that are now asking for a name on an order? Mistyped my name in a food order recently, and I just went with it because it was easier for them to think that I was Susie than Katie. But there, for some people, I know that's that's really depriving you of your autonomy as a person. What has been your experience, or where do you fall with something like that, where you know the average fast food worker may not care to try or on the flip side, you're still a person, you're still a customer. That's a really good question. And it's a funny thing for people who are new to going out with me to get to know. So there are some battles that I'm willing to fight about my name, especially if I'm in a, a class and I'm seeing a person on a regular basis, so you're going to say my name and you're going to say it correctly. But for those one-time interactions, I've worked at Starbucks and I've had to have the experience of having to say someone's name when their drink is up. I have what I call a white girl name. So it is Lauren. Uh, the reason for that is I wanted a name that had a fairly common spelling and was easy enough to not have that certain look of horror that baristas have when you tell them what your name is so that they don't have to struggle too much about writing it down. Um, let's like Sarah, for example, is it Sarah with an A, Sarah with an H, is it and with an E or and without an E? So Lauren seemed to be a good fit, but sometimes if I'm with someone, I'll use their name. So if we're making a reservation, I'll put it under this name rather than mine. Recently also, I've just been using my initials. So just the, the two letters and that works as well. It's so interesting too, because we all bring our own interactions or experiences to trying to pronounce names and having lived in other countries and speaking other languages, I'm just willing to blunder through through it because I want to try, but I know some people don't have that same confidence. And sometimes it really bites me in the butt. I did a conversation with someone recently in the US and they spelled their name Stefan, like the male version of Stephanie, but they were in America and I didn't associate, she doesn't speak French. It's probably Stephanie. And I asked her to pronounce it, pronounce it. And she was completely perplexed when I said, is it, is it Stefan? We just have our own associations fairly or not that inform what people are doing. In a perfect world, what do you think people in aquatics or recreation or workplaces who really value their employees or their team as individuals, what can more people be doing? Certainly, we all want someone to adopt something like this name drop, but what are some ways that you think that workplaces are maybe not making an effort to learn names that are less common to people's knowledge? It can be something as what one might think easy enough as like, oh, your name is too hard to pronounce, so I'm gonna give you this nickname. Um, or asking someone like, would you go by this name instead? This is difficult for me to, to understand or to adapt to. And I find that really, personally, I. It's offensive in a way because you're asking someone to change their name to make you more comfortable rather than being respectful and learning how to pronounce their name. No one is expecting you to pronounce it, pronounce it right the absolute first time, but like over time, especially if they're a colleague, especially if it's someone that you need to trust, respect, work with, etc., you should have enough respect for them to learn how to pronounce their name. I think for me, it's the the value of, do you actually respect who you work with? Would you want someone to constantly mispronounce your name on a, a daily basis? Would you want someone to misgender you, use different pronouns for you that don't fit how you identify gender-wise? It's all of those little paper cuts or things that don't seem that big on the surface, but over time, whether it's a short time or a long time, it gets exhausting and it makes someone not want to go and participate in a thing, whether it's work or an activity or something else, because you know that the labor of having to deal with a person who doesn't respect you enough to learn your pronouns, pronounce your name properly, whatever it happens to be, is too much. Like it's it's a burden on your time and your emotions. And then perhaps you quit that job. Perhaps you stop doing that activity and they will never, they'll never know why. But really it's, it's about trying to censor yourself because you deserve that respect rather than censor that other person's comfort or discomfort, quite frankly. And it's interesting that you say that because we were on a trip last year and a person who was also on the trip that we met misheard my name the first time. So instead of Katie, I became Kaylee and it progressed for eight, nine, 10 days. And it kind of got to a point, like you're saying, I, 
I didn't realize it bothered me so much until it was trying to become this, well, you know, don't call me Katie in front of them. I don't want her to be embarrassed. Like I was doing a lot more to protect her. And I'm sure it was just an honest mistake, but I didn't want to have the confrontation to correct it because I felt stupid that I'd left it that long. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure you've had to have some of these conversations. How do you start something like that in terms of initiating this is this is not the right name or you've you've misunderstood it or you're not making an effort? As a recovering people pleaser, I am definitely more direct when it comes to that conversation now. So I will immediately, as soon as I hear it mispronounced, I'll step in. I'll say, hey, I heard you say this it's actually pronounced this. So I try and deal with it as soon as possible because I have had experiences like a whole university class where I had actually two courses in the same semester where I had two instructors mispronounce my name in both those classes for an entire semester. And it got so bad that even my classmates were telling the instructor, no, her name is pronounced this way. And they still were not changing. So like a, a lot of people caught not wanting to get into conflict and just trying to like put your head down, get through it. It's only four months, but it wears at you. So my strategy is to deal with it as soon as possible. And if it continues, have a side conversation with this person saying the gentle version of, Hey, this is actually disrespectful. Could you do better? Have you ever had anybody older or somebody who's just really not committed to the process? I'm sure your workplaces are pretty progressive in terms of the circles that you surround yourself with, but have you ever had anybody who's just flat out not willing to try, not willing to meet you halfway? Not recently. I think the most recent example were those two uh, profs that I had, and I don't know if it was necessarily like they didn't want to or whether they just logged that certain pronunciation in their head. M my first degree is in education. They were both teachers. So as a teacher, you look at a name, you hear it once, oh, this is this person, this is how their name is said. And it's often hard to change, to re, uh, repopulate those neural pathways. But I haven't had anyone who has just been obstinate or malicious in the sense, hey, is this too hard? I don't want to. I'm just going to say it the way I'm going to say it. Have you had any people who are intensely curious or they're prying about the background of your name and, and what is an appropriate level for people to have in terms of interest in hearing a name that they haven't heard before, but also not placing on you the need to explain your whole life story and, and what you're doing? It happens fairly often. I mean, there's, uh, there's levels to it. So it'll, it'll be like, here is my name. This is the way you say it. Oh, that's interesting. Where are you from is often the follow-up question. And there's there's two versions of the way the story goes. One of them is with generally North American folk, generally white people, who will kind of just be like, oh, that's cool. This is the ethnicity. And then they'll leave it at that. What I have found in the last few years, especially in the job that I work at, I meet a lot of new Canadians or, or immigrants. And then they take that and they ascribe it to, oh, she's from where my ethnicity is from. So my parents are from Kenya. And they'll be like, oh, she's from Kenya. When that's not the case, I was born in Canada, I'm Canadian. I don't have that cultural, specific cultural background to adopt that label. So that, that has been an interesting side tension. And I still haven't quite figured out how to deal with that yet, apart from having maybe a conversation. Sometimes it's just... It's the introduction of, oh, my, my parents are from Kenya. I was named after my grandmother. And then it ends there versus, no, you are from this place that you have no identity ties to or no cultural ties to apart from the fact that your parents happen to be there. Instagram account I've been following for a while. I believe it's currently called Eat with Afia, and she's an immunologist doing her PhD in Toronto. She was born in Ghana. Her family is Ghanaian, but she lived all over. Her parents traveled quite a bit during her childhood, so she grew up in Zanzibar and in the U.S. and in Canada. And she describes similarities where she wants to be identified as Ghanaian, but she's she. You know, she's also Canadian and she's also lived in many other places, sort of an expat Ghanaian. And so making that distinction that it's it's not just one box. People have such different life experiences and it's too easy for someone to just say, oh, she's Kenyan. And that's, that's not at all accurate. And I think it's a lot of people just look for the straight answer, the simple answer, because that nuance is hard and complex to think about. And it, sometimes it makes your brain hurt. But I mm -hmm. think that's one of the, the lovely things about 
being a human is that you have that complexity to you. And to me, it's, it's fun to consider. It's a part of somebody's journey. It's a, it's a portion. Of I had an experience as a swim instructor many years ago that has really stuck with me where I mispronounced a child's name in preschool and it was totally on me. It was week eight or nine. I should have known the child's name correctly. And the parent grabbed onto me and this was very astute and not inaccurate. If you cannot say his name correctly, he's not identifiable to you as a person. How do I know you've been tracking his skills and that you are accurately aware of him as a person and a student in your class? And so that's always stuck with me out of fear of that sort of explosion that the mom had at me. But I think it's a fair point. If we don't learn someone's name, how do we remember their skills in a class? Or how do we remember their assets in a team? Why do you think, you know, that a name is so important as part of, you know, identifying the person? I think it's like when you're when you're a small child, when you're a toddler and you're starting to learn about the way that letters sound and the way that words work. It's one of those things that your your caregivers are constantly saying to you over and over again. So you start learning those sound patterns and later on you learn the speech patterns and then you learn to write your name with letters and pens and crayons and whatever else. So I think it becomes that fundamental part of your identity and anything that comes along to either challenge that or comes into conflict with it or you have someone that is willing to recognize that piece of um, that piece of your identity, your humanness. It's almost like having a mini existential crisis, I would say, because you feel you get defensive. You feel like you have to be like, no, this is this is my name, or you feel like you have to change yourself in order to adapt to your environment. There's many different manifestations on how this could go. But it's, it's that challenge to your base level of identity, I think. How do you overcome that? Because it's something that's been ingrained in you since literally probably a couple of days after you, you were born, your parents started saying your name to you. Other people started saying your name to you. And it was one of those things that you constantly heard and ingrained itself in your mind. It's definitely that base piece of identity that people attach to. And, and when that uh, when that identity comes up against a challenge, you, you it's almost like a fight or flight, right? Or a fawn or freeze, however that manifests. For you. So when I think back to that one interaction, it was very significant for me in my career as a swim instructor. I learned a lot of great things from that interaction. I think one of the other things that I've learned since then is, is also the naming process. When you think about how your parents decided what to name you, what family members or significant people in history they wanted to commemorate. We carry that tradition forward when we say the name correctly and respectfully to the best of our abilities. And so definitely that one interaction is part of the reason we're usually I'll try and blunder through it. I'd rather make an effort to try than do nothing because I think that mom was impacted both as a mother, like how she was seeing her child being seen. And then a very valid point, because if you're teaching three or four hours of swim lessons and every half hour you're getting another four or five kids, how are you doing a good job of memorizing, you know, Susie versus Jimmy versus John? And a name can be an important part of that, I think. And yeah, this is a point I nearly forgot about. It's, it's dehumanizing in a way so I, I get that point I taught a like a college level class uh, at the beginning of the year and a lot of the students that come to the college I work at are international students specifically from India so there's a lot of names that are very similar like they have different combinations of kind of the same portions of, of names so that point about if you can't identify this person how do you track their skills it's definitely when you have a group of people who all have incredibly similar names and some of them are comb combinations of each other, it becomes even more important to learn people's names because that's a grade you. I have to know how you're doing and then call you by your name correctly and also develop a relationship all in the span of four months. So it's incredibly difficult when you have non-Western names. I think with a lot of Western names, they're simple, quote unquote, enough where you can easily attribute them to people, but it's the names that are unfamiliar 
that you have to work a little bit harder to, to understand, like, this is the name of this person, this is what they're like, and then this is how they're doing in my class. I need to remember these various things about them so I can accurately assess them. Well, and there's so much to names and etymology, and I'm not an expert at all. Recently, I learned, and I studied religious studies in school, and I had no idea that culturally, a lot of Muslim and Arabic families, the woman does not change her name. And so that is a very common practice in certain regions. And so it didn't surprise me in 2024 that some women don't change their name, but that it can be etymologically part of a certain geographic region or part of a certain culture. And then I did have a student last year who they have to provide their driver's license during the certification process to do the licensing test. And I got this driver's license and there was only one word in the name. Mm. Yeah. And I had never seen that before. I asked a colleague who their spouse is a police officer. And I said, is this a real driver's license? I've never seen this before. He had never seen it before either. And after doing some research, it is allowed. But my software didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Having only one. It's interesting. Like the things I've learned about names as well with my, my full-time job, like the, the one name, it's, it's an attribute of the caste system specifically. So having just the one name might mean that you are of a lower caste. And then also the abbreviations of LNU, last name unknown, and FNU, first name unknown, um, are made for like a Western system to be able to track non-Western names. And if a person has one of these in their name or in their, their Western Westernized name, it's an indicator of where they might fall also in the caste system. If you have a full name, you are of a higher cat in a very specific area of the world. Well, and I another one that's often come up for me is different uh, ethnicities who might choose a westernized name on the roster. And I'll say, you don't have to give me a westernized name. I will do my best. But for their comfort level, they have so much friction in their life already day to day that it, it may be easier for them. I had one recently where the employer, the HR person, told me a completely different name from what the person's legal document had and the licensing paperwork is not so exact we have some flexibility for the course i teach but i was still shocked that the hr person may not even fully understand the person's provided a simplified name that's not their name there's also a tangent to trans and non-binary folks who are wanting to use their their name that they've chosen or their preferred name or, and they have their government name and their government name is what they still have to be referred to until such time as they can change it so that's always also interesting for how do you log them appropriately within a test sheet or software? Do you go with their preferred name? Do you go with their government name? Do you do both? How do you do both? which one is going to be accepted over the other. One of the great things with the CPO program I teach, we don't track gender at all. I, there's no reason to track it. And I think that's great that we don't track it because exactly to your point, I've had a number of conversations where I'll say in my class, I need ID before you start the test. And I usually get some panic text messages once every few months that says I need to call you. And I'll preemptively based on if I have seen them on Zoom say, I'm not checking you know, the name presented on the ID. I'm pre I'm checking the photo that you present as looking in appearance and geographic location to what you've stated. I'm not here to police name usage to the extent that you, you know, you're not inventing a completely random name that that may be you sitting the test for someone else. Um, I had one person recently who was presenting differently, but all the documentation was what I needed. And that's, that's all that matters. They have the right not to have to tell their story for the hundredth time this year. For sure. And it's not just trans and non-binary folks. It's also people who go by their middle name or people who prefer going by a shortened version of their name. So there's all sorts of reasons why someone would want to go by a different or preferred name. But I think human resource systems still have a lot of catching up to do in order to accommodate what people want to be called and how they want to present themselves officially, whatever system is, is going to log them. I, I think the other piece for people just to think about when we're thinking about all these naming components, we, we don't want to be overwhelmed, but there is a lot of detail to why somebody chooses the name. I have a family member who recently went through a divorce 
they were married for a very long time, but the divorce was terrible, decided after 25 years to go back to their maiden name and doesn't really want to have to explain to people what precipitated that switch. They were very hurt. They're, they want their identity back a certain way. And I can only imagine the number of times, because forms for women, you have to put all these different versions of the name you've ever had. And I don't typically see the same thing for men or other individuals. No, I, I would agree with that. So we've talked about the name drop. We've talked about some of these conversations people can have in the workplace in terms of making sure that there is accuracy in the representation of names. Is there anything else in this sphere of naming or the way people are using their names or their colleagues' names that you feel like is missed in general conversation or we could be doing better in our industry? One other element of people using different names, I think is not necessarily talked about as much, is the element of well, why are you choosing to go by a different name? That seems suspicious. Like it sows some seeds of distrust where one, it's none of your business unless somebody else wants to make it your business or tell you that story. So if somebody wants to go by a different name, that is on them. And then unless it's either uh, like criminal or disrespectful or whatever else, any sort of reasons along that line, sure. That is, you're making poor life choices at that point. But I think on a day-to-day -day basis, here's somebody I, work, somebody I work with. You have no reason not to trust them until they give you a reason not to trust them. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really valuable advice because you're right. I should say in my own experience, I have experienced a shift in temperature in the room when somebody uh, during attendance, they ask to be called something else or they're defensive because other individuals have not endorsed or supported a different name other than what's legally presented. And frankly, when I get a roster for a class, half the time it may not be typed correctly. It's not even that the name was intentionally done wrong. It's it's just how somebody typed it. So I tend to not be surprised if a name is different from what I'm given, but I know a lot of situations that's not the case. People are really hard and fast, especially with alphabetical order. Yeah, there's a lot of things that people are used to that don't necessarily work all the time um, and treating them as black and white solutions to very gray concepts is, is not good for anybody. Have you experienced, I know this has come up a few times for me, uh, people switching first name and last name because they don't know what they're looking at on the page. So my last name is Crysdale. Some people just assume my name is Crystal as a first name because they just glance at it. Oh, would you also correct that right away? Or how, how would you have that conversation with someone? I started switching my language around how I ask people to write their names, especially because the students that come to the college I work at, um, First name, last name is a pretty Western phenomenon. So I'll often say like, tell me your family name for a last name and then tell me your given name for a first name. Because that's what a lot of people will understand, either family name or surname and then given name. That seems to eliminate a lot of the confusion there. Well, I think that's a really important distinction I've never considered because even as you were talking, I was thinking first name, if you had, you know, Mary Jane, Samantha Jones, first name could be Mary, but your first name, your preferred name is Mary Jane. But then the last name, as you were saying, there's certain family names that are quite long, you know, especially if you have um, a hyphenated last name or a maternal and a paternal name together. If it's not specified, let them make the distinction as to what should be the identifiable family name. Would you do this as a quick in-service topic? I feel like this is something that people are either fully into, like they're promoting and doing actively because they have to based on their own life experiences, but then a lot of pools are probably doing nothing. And then it's, it's forcing the person with the slightly different name to be isolated and identifying their name versus everybody's name should be properly pronounced and respected. So how would you or how have you done this in any workplace scenarios that you've been in? One of the elements that we've been doing a lot at my full time job is talking about anti-racism initiatives and this falls into the category of what's called a microaggression so um, if people want to learn more about that that's something that they could uh, find out a little bit more about there's lots of podcasts out there and blogs and youtube videos that will teach you base baseline element of like what is a microaggression and then i would challenge people to just not do those. Don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to cause those little bits of emotional harm or emo cause your coworker to do that tiny bit of emotional labor, because chances are it's probably something that they're getting really tired of doing and they do it because they, they feel like they have to. 
But if you can be that person that creates that space for them to just exist as anybody else would, I feel like that's a re- like a really respectful thing to do. Um, cause the last thing that somebody wants to do when they go into a course is have to say their name so many different times and uh, like quite frankly, kind of justify why they're there. Many other people do not because their, their name gets pronounced correctly. Their gender presentation matches their pronouns, whatever else. Just being someone who can create that space for someone to just exist as they are. Well, and I I know for myself, the first day of any course, I have to really, really build in a lot of repetition because when I don't do that, I get to day two and the freedom of day one to get it wrong is gone. The necessity to know names is there. And if I haven't practiced, it's definitely an issue. And it shouldn't be that I'm forgetting one person or two people out of a group of 12. That really is not a pleasant experience for them. And it is disrespectful of me to have memorized 10 names, but not the final two for whatever reason. Microaggressions is something people may think they're working to towards, but there are lots of aspects like the name piece that we're having this conversation about. As soon as I saw that link in your signature, I thought this is something that a lot of people are not even thinking about at all. So that's definitely one of the reasons why I wanted to chat with you. And guaranteed, if you're not thinking about it, somebody else is because this is their every day. One other thing I wanted to mention is like a, a strategy. Instead of the instructor or the facilitator checking off the names on the list, have people introduce themselves. So you can do attendant with the group that's in the room, but you're hearing people pronounce their name as they would like it pronounced. And then it also helps everybody else as well. Even if it's something as short as a first aid resource or, or as long as a CPO course or a swim instructor course, you will have to refer to each other by the, your name or their name at some point. So it just helps everybody. Let's all learn each other's names so we can have this environment where you don't have to struggle to remember names. And then I also have name tags as well that I have people wear. That's that's definitely something that I'm seeing shifting. I don't teach as much aquatic leadership on the deck with young kids, but I know there's been a lot of conversations about some of the longer term effects of Zoom school and fewer individual interactions for the current generation over the last five years. But it was really discouraging. I had a class in the spring where we got to day four and the kids were referring to each other without names, like you in the black bathing suit and not in a lifeguard capacity, but as a, hey, we need to stop what we're doing and reintroduce ourselves and provide some identifying information. And part of your leadership and teamwork evaluation is going to be referring to each other by name because this is a very small class. There is no reason after four, eight hour days, you you couldn't be bothered to learn your your teammates name. It's fine that you don't know them well. There's cliques in a lot of groups, especially in high school, but you got to at least pretend to care about your classmates in a, in a, in a lifeguarding course. Like I mostly I train new swim instructors and I always tell them if you're not bothered to learn somebody else's name, some four-year-old is going to make sure you know their name. 100%. Do you have anything else you want to add, Gina? I don't think so. Thank you for this opportunity. I think it's like just a small piece of the conversation, but I hope it inspires people to actually, you know, talk about this wherever they are and explore some of the uh, tools that are out there. As I've been told, uh, Gmail has its own internal Mm. name function as well. I haven't tested it myself, but uh, if your organization uh, uses Gmail as um, as an email provider, you might want to test it out. Like you said, this is a very small part of a huge conversation we could have regarding accessibility and the readability of emails and software. My goal with these interviews and these videos is very much to make microtopics so it's more accessible because I do find that people are getting so overwhelmed. Conferences are great. Full day seminars are great. But if that's preventing us from actually taking action, I'd much rather somebody watch six minutes of this video and then put a line item on their next in service. We should talk about this. Maybe we'll get to a policy down the road, but at least taking a moment and asking people to re-identify their preferred name because things also shift. When we work with young people, somebody hired at 15 may have a change in their beliefs or a change in their lifestyle that does precipitate a moment to change their name. And I've been I've participated in a few of those on the official HR side, but I'm sure there were many more where people just left the job because they didn't want to have that conversation in their established workplace. And having the conversation in a way that is respectful and isn't attacking or will cause someone to be 
defensive or feel that you're attacking them is is the way to go. So if you are going to approach these topics, just try and do it in a way that maintains emotional safety in there. Um, Because having to make your coworkers yet again have to do the labor of making you feel comfortable does nobody any good. I completely agree. I was just reading something before we got started, doing things the hard way. It's not to, it's not to praise hustle culture or bro culture, but saying sometimes the, the best way is the hardest way and looking for all these shortcuts and hacks that we see popularized on social media removes the need to actually make a change. If you wouldn't let your your um, employees take a shortcut on something that is like incredibly important to the process of them delivering upon their training, then don't let them get away with this either. So that's all I've got. I want to say a big thank you to Gina Wakai for having this conversation. Do you have anything else you want to add? No, uh, thanks for, for doing this. And I just hope this inspires um, some thoughts, some conversation, maybe some policy changes. That'd be cool. But if that is too big of an ask, at least, Take some time to have a conversation about about it at your place.